A current loop and a flat permanent magnet generate the same magnetic field. And that is the field of a magnetic dipole possessing both a north pole and a south pole. In other words, we could say that a current carrying loop acts as a magnetic dipole. What this means is that it generates a magnetic field with a certain orientation that has both a north and a south magnetic pole that can never be separated. For current loops, it's very useful to define a quantity called a magnetic dipole moment. A current loop's magnetic moment is a quantity that frequently appears when working with loops of currents and the magnetic fields they generate. A loop's magnetic moment is a vector, defined as the product of the loop's current and the area it bounds acting in the direction of the magnetic field along the loop's central axis from south to north. We would like to study the effect of a magnetic field on a magnetic dipole. We could study this effect by looking at how a magnetic field exerts a torque on a magnetic dipole's moment. An external magnetic field will exert a torque on a magnetic dipole. This torque acts to align the magnetic moment, and hence the magnetic field of the dipole, with the external magnetic field. Let's explore this by looking at an example. Suppose we have a rectangular loop of current that can rotate around an axis that passes through its middle. This rectangular loop is elevated at a particular angle above the horizontal. One side of this rectangular loop is of length L, while the other side is of length W. Let's choose an X, Y, and Z rectangular coordinate system where the x-axis is horizontal, the y-axis is vertical, and the z-axis is along the line coming straight toward us. The loop has current I that flows through it in a clockwise direction, as we would observe if we were to look down on it from the positive y-axis. To help us with our analysis, we'll divide the loop into four straight line segments numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. Segment 1 is the segment where the current first enters, heading up the loop until it reaches segment 2. The current then moves away from us in segment 2 until it reaches segment 3. At segment 3, the current moves down until it reaches segment 4. Along segment 4, the current is coming towards us until it finally returns along segment 1. Let's put this loop in a uniform magnetic field that is parallel to the positive x-axis. This magnetic field will exert a magnetic force on each of the line segments according to the formula that we have found previously. The magnetic force on a current carrying wire is equal to the product of the current in the wire, the magnetic field, the length of the wire, and the sine of the angle between the current direction and the magnetic field. For our analysis, we'll need to determine the magnetic force on each segment and the torque created by each of the magnetic forces. Let's also model the location of the magnetic force on each segment as being located at the center of that segment. For segment 1, the magnetic force is equal to the product of the current, magnitude of the magnetic field, length of the current, and the sine of the angle that the current makes with the magnetic field. The right-hand rule then tells us that this force points inward in the negative z direction. Let's now draw this current loop from the perspective of looking at it from the positive z-axis.
This perspective will allow us to better see the relationship between the currents, magnetic field, and magnetic force on segments 2 and 4. From this perspective, we see that the current in segment 2 is flowing away from us, represented by an X, and the current in segment 4 is coming towards us, represented by a circle. The magnetic field on each of those segments is directed horizontal to the right in the positive x direction. The magnetic force on segment 2 is equal to the product of the current, mag magnitude of the magnetic field, length of segment 2, and the sine of the angle the current makes with the magnetic field. The right-hand rule tells us that this force points downward in the negative y direction. The magnetic force on segment 3 is identical to segment 1's, except that it points in the opposite direction, which is in the positive x direction. The magnetic force on segment 4 is identical to segment 2's, except that it points in the opposite direction along the positive y-axis. Segments 2 and 4's forces produce a torque about the loop's axis of rotation. This torque causes the loop to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. When we sum all the forces acting on all the loop segments, we see that the total net force acting on the loop is zero. This is due to the fact that the force on segment one and three are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, summing to zero. The forces on segments two and four are also equal in magnitude and opposite direction, also summing to zero. But even though the net force on the loop is zero, the net torque is not. The net torque on the loop is equal to the sum of the torques produced by all the forces acting on the loop. The only contribution to the net torque is due to forces two and four. This is because the forces on segments 1 and 3 act on the same line parallel to the loop's rotation axis, and therefore can produce no torque about that axis. But since the forces on segments 2 and 4 do not act along the same line, they will produce a net torque that is able to rotate the loop counterclockwise about its rotation axis. We will call this counterclockwise rotation the positive direction for torque. Recall that the torque due to a force is equal to the cross product of the position at which that force is applied relative to the rotation axis and the force itself. For our purposes, it will be more convenient to express torque acting as equal to the product of the magnitude of the relative position of the applied force, the magnitude of the applied force, and the sine of the angle between the relative position and the applied force. The direction of this torque is given by the right-hand rule. Notice that R2 is just equal to half of the width of segment 1 while the magnetic force on segment 2 is equal to IBL, which is just the product of the current I, the magnitude of the magnetic field B, and the length of segment 2, L. Therefore, the torque on segment 2 is equal to 1 half the width of segment 1 times IBL, sine of theta 2. This torque produces a counterclockwise rotation. Similarly, 
the torque on segment 4 due to the magnetic force on that segment is equal to the distance r4 that segment 4 is from the axis of rotation times the magnitude of the magnetic force on segment 4 times the sine of the angle between r4 and the force on segment 4, which we'll call theta4. The direction of this force is given by the right-hand rule. So similar to segment 2, r4 is equal to 1 half the length of segment 1, and the magnetic force on segment 4 is equal to the magnetic force on segment 2, which was given as the product of the current, the magnitude of the magnetic field, and the length of segment 2. The angle theta 4 is also equal to the angle theta 2. This means that the torque on segment 4 is equal to 1 half the width of segment 1, times the current, times the magnitude of the magnetic field, times the length of segment 2, which is the length of segment 4, times the sine of the angle between the current and the magnetic field with segment 4. We can now write that the net torque is equal to the sum of the torques due to segments 2 and 4. This expression simplifies to be the product of the current and the width of segment 1, the length of segment 2, the magnitude of the magnetic field, and the sine of the angle between the magnetic force on segment 2 and the magnetic field. We'll relabel this angle to be theta, and this torque is would cause a counterclockwise rotation about the axis of rotation. Notice the product of the width of segment 1 and the length of segment 2. This product is just the area of the loop. This means that the torque can be written as the product of the current in the loop, the area of the loop, the magnitude of the magnetic field, and the sine of the angle theta. We've now arrived at a very, very important result. Notice the product of the current and the area of the loop, I times a. This product commonly appears when we perform calculations involving current carrying loops. From this, we define the magnetic dipole moment of a current carrying loop, mu, to be equal to the product of the current and the loop's area, where the magnetic dipole moment is a vector whose direction is given by the direction of the magnetic field created by the loop's current and is parallel to and lying on the central axis of the loop, from south to north. This means that we can rewrite the torque on the loop due to this magnetic field in terms of the product of the magnetic dipole moment, the magnetic field, and the sine of the angle between the magnetic force and R2. Looking at the magnetic dipole moment in our sketch, notice that the angle the magnetic moment makes with the magnetic field is the same angle theta that the magnetic force makes with R2. And remember, R2 just lies in the plane of the loop. This means that this torque can be expressed at the, as the cross product between the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field. We have now just derived the torque on a current carrying loop due to a magnetic field. Though we have derived this result for a rectangular loop, the cool thing about it is that it's valid for a current loop of any shape, boiling down to the cross product between the magnetic dipole moment, which remember, the magnitude of which is just the product of the current and the area of the loop, 
and the magnetic field. Now, from the sign of the angle between the dipole moment and the magnetic field, we can see that the torque is zero when the magnetic moment is aligned either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, and is maximum when the magnetic moment is perpendicular to the field. And it is this magnetic torque that causes magnetic dipoles, like a compass needle, to rotate until it is aligned with a magnetic field.